Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining DC Culture and History. My name is Edward uh, Ingebretson, Ed, my friends call me. Uh, and today's topic, and you, if you have been part of this for the last couple of series, expanding the moral circle, non-human animals and what we owe them. And uh, you may hear some uh, rumpus in the background because I have my non-human assistant who uh, has needs. Uh, he's sentient and he has needs and I'm not always attending to them. So should you hear uh, the creature in the background, it's all good. The painting that you see before you is, is John Hicks in 1830, and it's called The Peaceful Kingdom, <clears throat> and we're all familiar with it, we all know about it. <clears throat> in, in some ways, it's like The Vanishing Indian. When we, st we, started, we started saying things like The Vanishing Indian and Fenimore Cooper's books, all after we had, as a nation, essentially eliminated these persons and, and removed them from any kind of mainstream effect. So he, in terms with animals, too, what I'm calling the project of nostalgia, so that this particular painting, and this really was the only painting that Mr. Hicks did really through his life, 30 or 40 versions of it, and, and all of these are the, at about the time that you begin to find the development of zoos and the, the, the removal of animals from a mainline sense of life with people to um, extra, where they're taken away, they're used for food, and they're, they're, put in, they're put in places where one has to go to find to see them. So today's project is to say, <clears throat> what do we owe these people? Because they are people in a kind of sense. Non-human animals, what do I mean by that? That goes back to 1857 and uh, Carl Linnaeus, who actually put the human back into biology, into the biological uh, scheme as a homo sapiens. Before that, Aristotle had us listed as uh, under quadruped. So the question is then, suddenly now we are animals in a biological uh, sense, and so what does that mean? So today we're gonna to do a couple different things. The presentation examines, and the first couple of slides may be ones you have seen before. I'm, review, I'm reviewing some work I did last in the previous one of these. Tonight's presentation examines the inter interchange between human animals and animals in specifically commodity culture, culture that is buying and selling, culture that makes things out of things. We encounter animals daily, although likely we pay little attention or don't recognize these encounters as encounters. We eat animals, we wear them, our beauty, our health, our own products are tested on them. Animals perform for us and satisfy our needs for intimacy, as well as novelty. Human agency and indifference removes animals from their natural lives and displays them for a variety of human pleasures. But in what sense can we say that we own them? Western culture and its mix of theologies generally positions animals as subservient to humans. We don't even call humans animals, generally speaking. We forget that we are those. Post-colonial rhetoric subjugates the bodies of animals in the same discursive frame that gives Harriet Beecher Stowe the subtitle for Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Man Who Was a Thing. So what are, what are our, our questions that, we're, that we're, we're asking? What do we think about animals? How does this affect how we think about other humans? who taught us to think this way? What about our thinking can or should we change? And who speaks for animals? And a way of starting this afternoon is, is to ask some very basic questions about the lives we have together. What rights should animals have, very generally? Do we think about that? Should aesthetic considerations, how cute an animal species is or not cute, uh, affect decisions about whether or not they should have rights? In, in Spain, for example, in India, the constitutions give apes and other animals special rights, in part because they are so genetically close to humans. Should apes and monkeys have more rights than other animals? What, if anything, makes human beings exceptional? Or special. 
do animals have emotions? If you have a pet, have you ever noticed it express what you consider to be an emotion? And you will likely hear my creature here who's um, uh, experiencing something, I am not sure what, but uh, he's certainly vocal about it. Do animals think? And clearly, anecdotally, the answer to these questions is, you know, we certainly know that. We, they, we do know that they think, even if we don't understand how they're thinking, we can reason out what they are doing. Moralistically, do you think it's wrong to eat animals? What do you think about wearing fur? These two sound like they're coming out off a PETA ad. Many people believe that factory farming is a cruel and unnecessary practice and that our world and our diets would be healthier. What do we think about that? Keeping animals as pets or in zoos or circuses is selfish, unnatural for the animal, and humane. More or less, that being said, what do we do with these kinds of things? Do we keep with zoos? Do we keep with the pets? Do we close the circuses? There has been change in movement and all this, and so we're collapsing a lot of material here that if you're paying attention in the, in the newspaper, all of these issues have been discussed in some kind of form or fashion. The primary question, and I've asked this before, is who teaches us to think this way? Because the axiom is, when I think I am most myself, when the thoughts in my head I think are most mine, they probably were put there by somebody else. So a kind of self-reflection on where do we get our attitudes towards factory farming and meat and animals and uh, what we would call PETA or the Humane Society and pets and zoos, philosophy and theology, Aristotle and the geopolitics of Genesis, for example. Uh, over all these creatures, I give you dominion, which is a, actually a misreading of Genesis. Commodity and culture, you know, that in the 20th century, for example, uh, everybody needs milk. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, um, maybe so, but perhaps it's not cow's milk that a human needs. And um, so perhaps if we, when you have a lactose-free milk, maybe it's because we are the wrong species for this. And this is a, an advertisement rather than anything else. So Alex de Tocqueville in Democracy in America has something to the point of other politics that I do. And, and it's going to fold in here and, and Harry Beecher Stowe's The Man Who Was the Thing because the question beneath the other things that we're talking about here today is the thingness of animals, the thingness of non-humans. Are they there to serve us? Are they our resources? Or is there something about them that is in some ways deserving, worthy, and uh, designed to have respect? De Tocqueville in Democracy in America, and, and this, however many American studies majors will read this book, they probably don't ever get this in class. Might one say that the European is to men of other races what man is to the animals? He makes them serve his convenience, and when he cannot bend them to his will, he destroys them. In one low oppression, he has deprived the descendants of the Africans of almost all of the privileges of humanity. Mr. de Tocqueville on a tour of the United States in the 1830s was a witness to the, the, the beginning of the, the Cherokee Tears, Cherokee Walk of Tears. He was there as they were moving the uh, indigenous persons off the land that, that had been given to them by the federal government. So that is partly what this uh, refers to. So and you'll see this particular frame again. Some animals we love and some animals we hate and some we eat. And, uh, how, how Herzog says, he calls it moral schizophrenia, um, we, we choose often not to think about these things. Uh, there is a group of uh, three figures, persons here today, who are choosing to think about this. Why do we love some creatures? Why do we love one creature, dress it up for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and why do we eat the creature, uh, put the creature on the table for Christmas, who is arguably smarter than the dog? Well, we don't like to think about that. Some creatures, the middle one, we hate. There is no particular reason why we should do that. I mean, the, the science will give you reason. I mean, in terms of, the, uh, if we can we buy a, we buy one of these animals at a pet store, and it's a perfectly fine. But when we find it in our yard, along with the chipmunk and the squirrel and, and all the other sorts of things, some of them we parse as we like and we don't like. And how do we make that kind of difference? 
Well, frankly, uh, this is domination uh, from, from dominion. This is from uh, Genesis. We love, hate, any what we want because we can. So this first part of the section, and I'm sorry this is going to sound a bit like a, a lecture here. There's not a lot of anecdotal pictures about these kinds of things, but to try and sort out for, for folks who are interested what we mean when we talk personhood, what we mean when we talk animal rights, what we mean when we talk animal welfare. And if we walk away here from this evening having a better sense uh, of walking into our kitchen and seeing that creature there and understanding whether the creature should have some kind of um, legitimate claim on us, as our child does, for example. Someone says, well, but, uh, but you, 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 you can't give a dog, for example, a, a, a moral kind of a claim because it can't contractually re refer back. But we do this, our morality is not limited by the persons who receive it. Or animal welfare, I mean, this is the rhetoric that you see, you know, we have bigger cages and we help animals Helping an animal die, as uh, uh, people will say, uh, easier or better, is not taking care of them. And we'll see the, the, the wider issue of this then becomes abolitionism for animals. So animal rights, animal welfare, or the abolitionists, these first little slides are going to talk about how to differentiate between these. Animal rights, animal welfare. The rights positions, just generally speaking, using animals is morally wrong. There are gradations on that, clearly, and we'll see some of those. The benefits. We should not use animals to benefit ourselves. <clears throat> there are extremes on this, of course, because there's always going to be a no but. There will be a no but through all of this. We're going to walk away here this afternoon, and each one of us is, is going to have to make, and probably already has, made the decisions that she or he will make about the how we interact and work with the creatures on our porch, on our decks, and the squirrels, and the Norwegian black rats, and the rabbits, and all the creatures, the deers that eat our salad, eat our gardens as salads, um, they all make a different claim on us. And we have opinions about all of them, and perhaps we've never really thought about some of those opinions. Interests. We should not invariably overrule the interests of animals with human interests. We'll come back to that. It's called the equal considerations. That if a human has pain, it's, it's to be taken into account. If a non-human animal has pain, that also should be given uh, account. We should not inflict pain or death on animals. It seems, seems pretty obvious, doesn't it, when you think about it? Um, one way of catching somebody's attention in a movie, as um, a number of people have pointed out, is to kill an animal. Uh, you re may remember in House of Cards, the very opening scene of the first of the first show, Kevin Spacey walks in, and Georgetown, <clears throat> and he, and here's a dog uh, hit by a car or something on the side of the road, and he kills it. And of course, that immediately catches everyone's attention. Um, but the astronomical number of animals killed for human interests a year, we don't think about. Humane treatment in the rights position. We should always treat animals humanely and eliminate the human-made causes of animal suffering. Okay. The welfare position is probably the position that commodity gives us. It's the position that Whole Foods will give us. And I use Whole Foods, Whole Foods because Whole Foods is probably, in, this, in the west, east coast of the part of the United States, um, now that's associated with Amazon, is probably where many persons see kind of a higher end and an, an attempt to, if I can say this, signal virtue about the way that they treat animals. The welfare position, it, using animals is morally right when we can use animals to benefit ourselves. Some, you know, we come at, you hear about testing and food and all of the things that human beings need from animals the welfare position says if we take care of them while they're alive, we can use them in death. Our interests are always more important than the interests of animals. And, and this is where Peter Singer, for example, and others, uh, we'll talk about that, will differ. So here's the difference. Our interests are always more important than the interests of animals. Gary Francione's book, Your, your Child or Your Dog. <clears throat> suggests that. As a matter of fact, each of them, the child and the dog, have claims. 
which is of more important, then becomes the moral decision making, the ethical abilities of the persons in question. Welfare, we should not cause animals, quote, unnecessary pain or death. Um, the thousands and thousands of animals that are used in labs, for example, um, in the American uh, Slaughter Acts, they would call this necessary pain. We need to do this to these particular animals. Um, it's now 2022, and there's much change around this, uh, but still the laws simply say that, no, if you, don't, if you give this, this animal pain in the, in the laboratory, you, you can do that because it, it's necessary for humanity. We should treat animals as humanely as convenient to us. Again, the welfare position is dominance. We can because we are bigger, we are stronger. They are there to serve our needs. So I back to walk back through these last few slides. The real difference here is our interest, do they always take more uh, front and center than interest <coughs> sorry, of non-human animals? Should they serve us at our convenience? Different persons, uh, the ethicist Martha Nussbaum, I'm going to point out to her for a couple of reasons because she's one of the few uh, um, female uh, ethicists in the business. And so she brings a very different take to this. There is no reason why basic notions of basic justice, entitlement, and law cannot be extended across the species barrier as the Indian court boldly has. And we will see that. That Spain, for example, has it in its constitution. It, the Indian courts also have it in their constitution. Um, that animals have a very specific legal place. C.S. Lewis against the section, we may find it difficult to formulate a human right of tormenting beasts in terms of which it would not equally imply an angelic right of tormenting humans. So he's coming at this from a different point of view that, and, and to, to paraphrase something that I've quoted before about, about, about Darwin, um, Darwin said, there, I see no material difference between non-human animals and human animals. There's a difference in degree, perhaps, but not in kind. Okay. Uh, Tom Reagan, who passed a year or two ago, you don't change unjust institutions by tidying them up. <coughs> Excuse me. Animal Liberation Front, which is pretty much on the far end of abolitionism. We are a new breed of activism. We're not your parents' humane society. We're not friends of animals. We're not earth save. We're not Greenpeace. We come with a new philosophy. We hold the radical line. We will not compromise. We will not apologize. We will not relent. Tom Reagan, in empty cages, uh, Reaganless issues that are priorities to achieve a shared animal welfareist agenda. Some of these you have been seeing happening in the last couple of years. The elimination of elephants and other performing animals from circuses. To the point of elephants, there, there is now a legal case being forwarded ab about personhood and, and elephants, and we'll get to that a little bit later. The liberation of dolphins currently imprisoned by the captive dolphin industry. Again, in the news, if you have been reading in the last couple of days, uh, captive dolphins and free dolphins have recently been um, validated in terms of speaking back and forth. And they've now, um, uh, scientists and researchers have watched these animals and listened to them and realized that they are actually talking back and forth. The total cessation of canned hunting. And, you know, pause. One would think some of these should not be so hard to do. The total demise of the greyhound racing industry, because if you don't know what goes on behind greyhound racing and dog racing and horse racing, there is something that one can spend an hour or two. No more fur farms. Again, what you are seeing here, if you pay attention to where the fur comes from, if you pay attention to seal slaughter, if you pay attention to uh, some of these things, you understand that we, we would not do these. No more dog labs ban on the use of animals and toxicity tests. Uh, because, as a matter of fact, we don't need uh, toxicity tests. They, they can do that with computers. Uh, the, the paradox is we, we pick up, we use animals because they, quote, they are like us, uh, but then we're using them because they are not us. 
So Reagan concludes Empty Cages with, our faith in a better world is deeply rooted in history. There was a time when many thought it was utopian, unrealistic, and hopeless to achieve equal rights for Native Americans, his expression, African Americans, his expression, women, the mentally challenged, or the physically disabled. Nevertheless, the verdicts of history teach that entrenched social practices not only can change, they have changed, but never without a struggle. And the last line he's quoting Frederick Douglass. A question I ask in my ethics class often is, when did you become a, a full agent, moral agent in the United States? Um, if, if people look around and if you have some history of, of enslavement in one's family or if one has, uh, if one is a gendered feminine um, or an immigrant of different kind, one understands this as that the legal gradations that rights are, are always given by a legal institution. They're not, sorry, Jefferson, uh, natural history. Peter Singer, a principle of equal considerations. Essentially, Singer says, this means that if an animal feels pain, the pain matters as much as it does when a human feels pain. If the pain hurts just as much, how bad pain and suffering are does not depend on the species of being that experiences it. And that's for Peter Singer and for many utilitarians, the point. It's, it's a question of, uh, even back to Jeremy Bentham in 1789, who's going to say, you know, it's, it's not a question of whether these creatures can think or reason, because they know that we, we know they can. They are better in nature than we are in many respects. The question is, do they suffer? And should we be causing that suffering? So Will Ferris, okay, we've had, now we've, we've gone a little bit on uh, kind of an overview. I'm going to go through Will Ferris and uh, abolitionists. The goal of welfare organizations, and this is humane society, for example, has never been to eliminate institutions that exploit animals, be they research laboratories, factories, slaughterhouses, fur farms, or circuses, or rodeos, but rather reducing or ameliorating animal suffering within such violent and repressive structures. Um, I'm in DC, and DC has a fairly active um, animal care facility, uh, but not only media, but also structure. And one could argue that, you know what, we're doing a lot of what I would call wonky work, changing laws, but are we actually improving the lives of these animals? Gary Francione says, it, no matter how many kinds we, we have more bills to vote on for better treatment of animals, for California, you can't buy uh, puppies in a pet store. That makes us, the voters, feel better, perhaps. But the, the, the main places where animals are mistreated is, is not there, but elsewhere. And welfareists acknowledge that animals have interests, but they believe that these can be legitimately sacrificed or traded away if there's some overridingly compelling human interest at stake, which invariably is never too trivial to defend against substantive animal interest. Benjamin Franklin says it's so wonderful to be a rational person because you know, one has a reason for whatever one wants to do. Wolfarists simply believe that animals should not be caused unnecessary pain and hold that, that harm or death inflicted on them must be done humanely. I'm, we all know, and perhaps we are those people ourselves who will put our animal in a cage you know, at 8 in the morning and go off and go off to work. And usually it's as well, the, the animal likes the cage. And the question is, first, on the one hand, you say you don't know what your animal thinks or feels. And the second hand is, oh, well, but we know it likes this cage. Uh, does it? How do we know that? Can we speak for that animal? Animal rights persons often reject the utilitarian premises of welfareism. This is not an ethics class, but the point then, welfare acknowledges animals have interests, but the greater good, this is the utilitarian position, the greater good for the human being means uh, that the good of the animal has to give away. It allows the freedom and the happiness in the lives of animals to be sacrificed to some alleged greater human need or purpose. The philosophy of animal rights does not emerge until publication of Tom Reagan in, in 1983. From 1975, when uh, Peter Singer did the first book, The Case for Animal Liberation, it was a, a utilitarian, particularly, point of view. Reagan and other animal rights theories argues that a basic moral equality 
exists among human and non-human animals in that they are beep sentient, this is the first big word of the day, and therefore have significant interests or preferences, such as not to feel pain that should be protected and respected. Um, you see people walking along the street dragging a puppy and they say, we don't know what the puppy feels or thinks. Uh, any puppy that is uh, resisting this clearly has an opinion about it. Perhaps it might be a moment to say, oh, what is it that this dog is resisting? What does it need? Uh, granted, all of us have been in situations where we will tell our husbands and our wives and our children and our pets, um, because we have dominion over them, we simply c can marshal them the way that we want. So the strict rule is of looking at the animal and saying, well, what is it asking that it needs? So Reagan, for example, argues that many animal species, chimps, dolphins, cats, dogs, are akin to humans by having the type of cognitive characteristics that make them subjects of a life. In Cambridge, the 2012 uh, uh, Cambridge Conference on um, Sentience basically said there is no difference between a non-human animal's uh, ability to neurologically have sentience and a human. Um, that Darwin would say that humans have more perhaps complex mental abilities, memory and self-consciousness, but so do animals. Absolutely so do animals. When you go to work and you know after two or three days the dog or cat understands when um, whomever uh, is coming home. So uh, anecdotally we know that within a limited sense um, we, we, we are dealing with and even a cow in, in, the, in the farm, if it sees you walking across the field, it's going to come walking over to you. So there is some process here happening that however we want to call or think about it. So that arguments that only humans have rights because they are the only animals that have reason and language, besides being factually wrong, back here we're talking about the dolphins, are completely irrelevant as sentience is a necessary and sufficient condition for having rights. And you read in the newspaper about dogs who jump in to save deer and, you, and that uh, <clears throat> killer whales who actually will tug boats home, uh, tug, tug tour boats back to port because they've been stuck. So one asks, what might claims of basic justice be? Again, we are the human ones who make and make these decisions. And that is going to change it. So if I'm the one who's deciding what rights my dog should have or should not have, do I ask its opinion? Do I know how to? Should I? Uh, and these are from the, from the Five Freedoms, which was uh, out of the UK in about 1960. They said at a minimum, there should be what they call the Five Freedoms. The freedom from unnatural death. The freedom from enslavement or being owned by another. The freedom from kidnapping. The freedom from torture or experimentation. Freedom from servitude or inhumane treatment. Freedom to live in their own natural habitat. Uh, if one takes this seriously, probably one is going to turn off the computer here today and, uh, and zoom and go away because this means that, to quote Maria Rilke, du musst ein Leben ändern, we must change our life in some form or fashion. 2004, the Manila Conference on Animal Welfare. The welfare of animals, when they mean here non-human animals, shall be a common objective for all nations. The standard of animal welfare attained by each nation shall be recognized and observed by improved measures, nationally and internationally, respecting social and economic considerations, religious and cultural traditions. All appropriate steps shall be taken by nations to prevent cruelty to animals and to reduce their suffering. Appropriate standards on the welfare of animals be further developed and elaborated, such as but not limited to those governing the use and management of farm animals, companion animals, animals in scientific research, draft animals, wealth, wildlife animals, animals and recreation. So again, even here with the Manila Conference, you see the no but. There is obviously and clearly since the late 20th century a, a, a movement forward to think about. On the one hand, you have Spain giving uh, its, its, uh, in its constitution rights to primates, while it, it also permits things like bullfighting to go forward. 
So uh, cultures are not always growing up all at once in the same way that people are not growing up all at once. Uh, and one sees movements here to return again to what we are doing here. I'm sitting here and I can look out on my deck and I can see, again, a variety of, a variety of species, all of whom, uh, as a matter of fact, come with the human beings. They move across the country as, as human communities move. And we may have brought some through here in terms of the black squirrels, in terms of pigeons, we, uh, rabbits. We have brought them from other sorts of places. But as a matter of fact, um, they're, now, they're not now technically what we would call wild animals, nor are they called farm animals. They're the animals that kind of inhabit the human community. But so the failures of, of, of legal law, for example, the Animal Welfare Act, the only federal law that provides protection for animals in laboratories, but it specifically includes rats, birds, bred for research, who constitute 90, 95% of animals. So it, 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 the thing about it, I won't, I won't spend much time on that, the thing about the laws is uh, they are designed by commodity persons, Purdue, for example, Tyson's Chicken, uh, McDonald's even, um, who, who have a need and use these kinds of products. So while they're going to be passing laws that seem to suggest their interest, the, the point is, as uh, Francione is going to say, is that they are making basically the law doers feel better. Now, the Humane Society, one of a number of very corporate uh, animal care, and it has its own history of dominion and its own history of, of, of problems in taking care of its human animals. So I'm just going to put, put on the point over here is that, I, I, you know, the ASPCA, SPCA, what we're doing here in PETA, um, PETA is, is, is probably more on the abolitionist end, uh, Humane Society is more on the welfareist end, and where, where one chooses to give one's money, um, and my husband and I, for example, are, are, are probably going to be giving money at some particular point to a, a local shelter, a local institution, in the same kind of way as that, that there's no reason that, uh, I, I, my own personal feeling is that I, I distrust, possibly in some ways, these, the, the commodities. The abolitionists, animals, property, and the law. Uh, we cannot justify treating any sentient non-human as our property, as our resource, as a thing that we can use and kill for. Okay, right there. Steps, he says, toward a morally coherent treatment of animals. And I think that is a useful expression, is that as one grows and one ages and one becomes um, more developed, uh, even with our children, and I say in my particular class to, to the students, uh, and these are, these are adults, actually adult learners, uh, when did your parents uh, help you to define your ethical life? When was your first ethical life? Uh, and they look at me and I said, when did you get your first goldfish or your, your first pet? And they say, well, I was seven. I said, well, um, and we know how that went for the goldfish, don't we? And they, they all kind of like chagrin and they laugh. So morally coherence is how do we end up, as we put these pieces together, taking the intuitions and the, the steps that we have and making it coherent. How do we, we all have goodwill, and back to, to being here in DC, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the kind of work that we're doing over here, and you know, DC is a wonky culture, it's government, and, and so we understand that. But the kinds of information that the Humane Society and the, the wonkers, if you want, of the, of the town that are providing an animal care, one looks in vain and say in other kinds of universities or, or even high schools for any kind of education that would move us beyond the, the sentimentality of, oh, I like animals. Well, um, we like animals, but we expect a whole lot from them. So steps toward a morally coherent treatment of animals. He rejects campaigns that seek more humane exploitations. Bigger cages, don't sell these kinds of animals from these kinds of places. Um, condemns animal use, period, straightforward, done, done. Regards veganism as a moral baseline. We'll see a bit more on that. Uh, animal rights, the abolitionist approach. Here's a list of animal rights vegan organizations that Gary Francione believes are doing good work. And you see, there are none. So he's strict line. There is no question about it. And probably all of us are going to fail that point. 
Um, but we're going to do what we can, and, and part of what that is is uh, none of us knows as much as Gary Francione does, and uh, we have a life that we have to live in, and in the same kind of way that we make accommodations for our spouses and our children, and, and all, the various ways in which we have a life, that part of that having a life is how to sort out, how to handle, you know, for example, you know, you you, know, you, you don't like the Norwegian black rat in your backyard. Um, well, so you call up, you know, a, a pest control person and they come out and put poison out. Well, and there goes the raccoons and there goes the squirrels and there goes the birds and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one comes to a place of where one has to make a kind of a decision about this. And, and I, I used to feed birds more, what I call the city's pets, in our backyard one day I had a bull out there and in that there were there were cardinals, there were sparrows, there was grinches, there was a um, dove, there was a black rat, there was a brown squirrel and a black squirrel, all of them in the same dish, all of them in the same pottery thing. At one point the squirrel reached up and around and went like that to the to the black rat, but to the brown rat. But you know what? They were all living together peaceably. Um, and top of Maybe there's something here that we should be learning. So Francione is an abolitionist. He maintains we cannot morally, justly use any animal as a human resource. He opposes efforts to reform or to regulate animal uses. So he would he would just sniff at Tom Reagan's uh, or Tom Reagan. No, he would not sniff. He would agree morals with Tom Reagan is that simply making cages bigger, simply making cages better, um, simply making slaughterhouses more user-friendly um, does not, in fact, uh, Temple Gordon, for example, does, does not, in fact, help the animal. So he comes out strongly against promoting humane farming, vegetarianism, Proposition 2, the Humane Society of the United States, the boycott of the NFL for allowing Vic on the field. He, re he rejects nearly all of the campaigns promoted by the large animal protection organizations. And you say, well, why is that? I say, well, you can kind of Google Humane Society, for example, and um, the former president, who is no longer president for um, reasons, uh, you can Google what he was paid, and it's in the one, two, three, four, five, six, six figures at least, uh, and the double figures, and you're going, you know what, that money should be going to the local shelter down the street. You know, and Jonathan Suffern's book, Eating Animals Hurts, Not Helps, as much as the good as it does, because Franchoni's work is sharply critical of the utilitarian theory of Peter Singer, which says utilitarian is that the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Peter is more on the line of Francioni. Animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment, use for entertainment or abuse in any other way. And there's going to be a couple slides up here ahead of you that are going to cause some couple Grinches, but PETA are, are aggressive in their advertising, and and we probably, as you've gone through your own particular history, you remember different ads and you go comparing um, slaughter slaughterhouses to um, the Nazi regime, and there actually is some some basis in history for that, and uh, DC cultural history will be a presentation on that in, in a few weeks or so. Um, you're not wearing fur, not wearing different kinds of animals, and kind of this, these ads that are really kind of, as they say, in your face. So Animal Liberation Front. Um, these are the ads. I'm, I'm not going to either defend them or not, except to say that the that until the emergence of white supremacy as what the FBI defines as the quote, major uh, terrorist uh, threat in the United States, that these were the people who were um, chosen in opposition. And partly because, as a matter of fact, commodity culture, places like uh, McDonald's and places like Tyson's and places like Purdue, um, these persons were sneaking into places that are hidden and you want to, want to ask, is this, why should the places that are, why should food production be hidden from us? Why, if you're walking, if you're going driving through uh, through Maryland or Virginia or North Carolina and you see these long, long Quonset-like buildings with no windows in them, and you know that there are probably thousands of chickens in there, you're going, why are we not allowed to see what's happening in here? 
well, that should give you a pause. So uh, corporate law against the kinds of persons who are essentially letting you in is a reason. There are six principles. I'll try and do these quickly. Abolitionists believe all sentient beings, human or non-human, have a right not to be treated as the property of others. Because animals are property we consider as humane treatment that we were, if we did it as torture, if we were inflicted on humans. Principle two, abolitionists maintain that our recognition of this one basic right means we must not merely regulate institutionalized animal exploitation and that abolitionists cannot support welfare reform campaigns or single issue campaigns. So, translate. Recognizing the right of animals not to be used as property requires that we abolish institutionalized exploitation of non-human animals and not just regulate it to make it more humane. Factory farming is a place to start. Abolitionists reject animal welfare campaigns, single issue campaigns. Not pleasant. The, the issue, the image on the right, lower right, are uh, baby male chickens that are being, I'm sorry to say it, being ground up because they're male. Um, this is a milking machine for cows. And the point comes up in ethics class and people will say, I like milk. And I go, well, you're, you know, you're a mammal. How, does, how do mammals uh, um, make milk? I think it's sometimes, because all the process is hidden from so many of us, we fail to understand that uh, the mammalian species, the cow, functions in the same way that other mammalian species do. That, and uh, sorry, sorry again to put it this kind of way, that that a, a male, a mammal only lactates after certain conditions have been had. These creatures here, they're on the table of Thanksgiving, and they're smarter than the dog sitting at the table with the presents. Principle three. Abolitionists maintain that veganism is a moral baseline, that creative, nonviolent vegan education must be the cornerstone of animal rights advocacy. Well, the good news is here, uh, this is what we're doing. We're doing some kind of animal rights advocacy, and even if people walk away from this, everyone will have their own particular decision, and it is, it's at least education. And the, uh, vegan is, a, is an interesting kind of word, and people will say, well, sir, do you consider yourself vegan? Uh, everyone pronounces it vegan. They can, do what they want with that, but the um, the Latin in me pronounces it uh, vegan. I would say I would prefer to say that uh, one should be ethically food conscious. That is to say, that if your pizza is no cruelty to tomatoes, for example, in your pizza, that the person's picking the tomatoes, probably in Peru or some other place, also um, no cruelty to them. That is to say that rather than simply focus on the product in the, the food stuff, but also to think much larger in terms of the Marxian product here of the purses and the workers and the persons who are in fact, uh, who very often are not cruelty free. So they embrace the idea that there's veganism and there's animal exploitation, no third choice. For example, the South Florida vegan education group, I'm going, wow, how they do this in Florida? I don't, don't understand that. Four, the abolitionist approach links the moral status of non-humans with sentience alone and not with other cognitive characteristics. That is to say, I'm going to go back to um, 1789 when the philosopher says, you know what, um, the French have decided, and rightly so, that they are freeing their slaves. The day will come. This is, this is a paraphrase. He said, the day will come where all creatures will be judged, not by the color of their skin, by how many legs they have, whether they have a tail or not. Not whether they won't be judged, not whether they can speak or reason, um, but they will be judged typically just on, basically on their own equality as a sentient creature. And it's, it's, it's really not sensible to ask whether these creatures can think or to reason. The question that we should be asking for them is, do they suffer and are they in pain? Sentience is subjective awareness. 
There is someone who perceives and experiences the world. We know that. We can look out the window and we can see the cardinal and his mate that for years have been together. You can go down and you see the mallard, he and she together. We know this, that, that, that other species, um, they, may, they may have rhythms in the world that are different perhaps from our species, but they are sustained rhythms. They have a structure, they have a beginning, and they have a middle, and they have an end. Um, that uh, if you read the book When Elephants Weep and you, and you think about how elephants mourn, for example, and the kind of community that they form. So the recognition of sentience as a right on humans, the moral obligation not to use that being as a resource. Being kind, this is Tom Reagan, rest in peace. Being kind to animals is not enough. Avoiding cruelty is not enough. Housing animals in more comfortable, larger cages is not enough. Whether we exploit animals to eat, where entertain us or to learn, the truth of animal rights requires empty cages, not larger cages. Abolitionists re reject all form of human discriminations, including racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, and classism, and speciesism. Um, some of you may, f not, may follow some of the other kind of work that I do, and the point that I make there, and I'll make it here again today, is that the, the equipment and the structures of domesticity that we learned, tested on animals, is what we use in, to domesticate human beings, cages and collars and brands. Um, if this were a longer conversation, we could talk more about where the future would take us. And uh, ecofeminism is, and deep ecology are placed probably where I would place myself and as a, as a feminist would, would, would talk about um, if there's any being that is being suppressed or subjugated, that should stop. So in, in terms of ecofeminism tends to take a look at the entire environment in this particular way. Uh, and, and clearly, again, there's no, no simple answer to any of this, um, except to say that when, when one country simply f uh, eva evacuates any kind of efforts to think about global or climate change, one needs to think about, uh, and which is a commodity approach, how can we make a world together better? Abolitionists recognize the principle of nonviolence as a core principle. Active in over 40 countries, uh, the Animal Liberation Front, operate clandestinely, small groups, And these are the folks that would go into places with cameras. 2005, uh, officials of the FBI, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, quote, violent animal rights extremists and eco-terrorists now pose one of the most serious terrorism threats to the nation. In 2006, if you were paying attention yesterday in a different presentation that I was doing, they made almost the same point about white supremacists. So as an overview, there's much disagreement about whether non-human animals have rights and what's meant by rights, much less disagreement about the consequences of accepting that animals have rights. That is to say, if we walk away from here saying, well, I'm still confused, and if we walk away here and say, nope, absolutely, you know what, the man was right, he may have been not saying, saying it well, but there is, in fact, animals have to have rights. So the consequences of this, advocates hold that certain things are wrong as a matter of principle. There are some things that's morally wrong to do to non-human animals. Human beings must not do these things no matter what the cost. Modern human rights have four features and which are said to be natural, where Lewis did not invent them. Universal, they apply to everyone. Equal, they have the same for everyone. Inalienable, no one can lose them. Now, I'm just gonna to pause to you, and if you are familiar with United Nations history, you'll notice that the United Nations had its uh, Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights in, in uh, 1948. And since then, has every two or three years, has come out with a new Declaration of Rights for, Declaration of Rights for, Declaration of Rights for. So on um, the column on the left, uh, we all sitting here and chuckling, and the United States is, for example, going on and on and on about other countries for human rights violations, and we're looking, we're going, what? Do we ever pay attention to what happens here at home? 
So relevant rights for animals, the right to live freely in the, in the, in the natural world in the place of an animal's choosing. Well, you know, um, but we want to build a condo there. And, and, and you're, you're seeing, one is seeing more and more areas where, for example, there's a Leeds community in, in, in Britain that actually has designed an eco-friendly environment for animals as well. The right to express normal behavior, food, grooming, and nest building. I mean, you go into the, the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and you, you find um, borders all over the top of the, the, the statue because they don't want pigeons sitting up there. What can you say? Um, a, a point, you know, by the way, if you ever look at birds sitting on, on wires, you look at them and you're going, they're all equally spaced apart. They don't have tape measures, but they're not stupid. They know exactly how much space each bird needs, and they allot that particular creature that space. The right to life, not to be killed for human food or other human use. The right to reproduce, well, is your dogs fixed? Well, there was nothing wrong with them. The right to choose their own life, not for people to coerce into experiments or entertainment. I mean, you probably have seen the, the, the image of the, of, the, of the black bear in a circus who was so terrified by what it was trying to do that uh, the, the trainer was hitting the, the, the bear, having it stand on its front legs, which, which is an unnatural act for, for well, probably unnatural for other mammals as well. Um, and the bird, the bird, the bear urinated itself as it was trying to do this, out of just fear, anxiety. The right to live free from human-induced harm. Well, we have a ways to go. Now, clearly, we're not talking about all of these here tonight, but and this is an, an overview of what any kind of rights must might might think would be like. But to, just as the four on this side over here all the way down to Thomas Jefferson, and we hold these rights to be natural. No, we don't. And universal, they don't apply to everyone. They, Thomas Jefferson, they didn't apply to your son, your enslaved son, who was serving as your valet. Uh, they're not the same for everybody. Uh, any woman here knows that. They're not inalienable. Well, all of us can lose them, and we do at certain points. A non-human animal bill of rights. We're still collecting signatures to petition Congress for an animal bill of rights. The right to have their interests represented in court and defended by law. One is seeing some interesting movement on this, and it's going to be a parallel with the history of enslavement in uh, Britain and here, and we'll talk about that. The right of protection from human exploitation, abuse, cruelty, neglect, and unnecessary experiments. The rights for animals to satisfy their basic physical and mental needs. The right for pets to a wholesome diet and satisfactory shelter and veterinary care. The right for wild animals to a natural habitat sufficient for their ecological needs and to sustain their populations. So the case for animal rights is usually derived from the case for human animal rights. O oversimplified, it goes like this. Human animals have rights. There's no moral morally relevant difference between human animals and adult and non-human animal mammals. Um, this goes back as far as Aristotle and most recently uh, Cambridge, for example, in 2012, um, but Darwin in Origins of Species. So therefore, adult non-human mammals should have rights also. Um, this, this, fun, this is a funny expression between adult non-human mammals. Arist Aristotle says in, in the original Greek someplace, well, you can treat children almost as human beings, almost like human beings. So according to thinkers, human beings and adult mammals are subjects of a life. Again, anecdotally, we might know this as we're sitting here having our, our, our omelets and our chickens and our whatever else, but we don't pay attention to the creatures on our plate. They have similar levels of biological complexity. They all have eyes, ears, they tilt their head to listen. They're conscious and aware that they exist. They know what is happening to them. And if you think an animal doesn't know what's happening to it, in some ways, the animals, non-human animals, are much better, much more tuned to the human world, to the natural world, than we are. They prefer some things and dislike others. You see people dragging these creatures down the street, and you want to say, even you know, you see people dragging their children down the street, and you also want to say that. 
they make conscious choices. And I can talk to you, I'm sure anecdotally, you can talk about the time that your dog chose. You could see the moral calculations. Do you want this treat or do you want to go for a walk? They live in such a way as to give themselves the best quality of life. Watch how a creature as small as a gerbil will organize its cage and every three weeks change it. Ask yourself, what is this little creature doing? They plan their lives to some extent. Um, the creature who is following me around as we speak um, starts getting ready to amp up for dinner at about noon. Um, he's 15 and blind and deaf and so he has uh, lots of interests but limited ways of, of focusing on them. The quality and life of their quality of their life matters to them. So, if a being is the subject of life, it can be said to have inherent value. Liberally, we know this. Sentimentally, we know this. The only time we start fussing with this is, and we can know this with our own people. We can know this as 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 and in, in Reagan or Reagan a Singer talks about uh, how this works, or how individual species, human species how the human being gains legal status as she or he goes through life and then also begins to lose it. And I, every one of us has been in that situation having to adjudicate uh, where personhood um, is not all that it used to be. So the adult mammals have the rights in the same way for the same reason, adult mammals, and to the same extent that human beings have rights. We don't have time to think about all this, and this should be a nine-week course, but sentencia being able to suffer and feel pleasure. That's an easy one. Legal recognition and rights, conferral of protection or privilege. Again, everyone here has a legal right. It's given to us by a Congress, a legal system. These rights are not simply something that we can, we can rhetorically say, you know, it's, uh, these are my rights. But if the, if, if the language is rights, it's a civil protocol in place. Moral status worthy of moral consideration, thinking, interests, a stake in fulfilling a life's natural potential. Back to Aristotle. Aristotle would say that every creature has a need to thrive. For that particular reason, it's like, well, do you treat all your children the same way? We may love all of our children the same way, but this child needs this and this child needs this. So we can do the kind of the parsing and the ethical choices of of, of, of parsing out behaviors for different persons. Um, and what we're saying, we're agreeing with Aristotle, is that certain kinds of behaviors do not help this particular individual, whether this individual is a full-footed individual or, or two-footed, um, that different individuals have different eudaimonia, different spirits that they need to thrive. Intrinsic value, a value something has independent of its usefulness. Equal consideration of interests, Basically, again, that if my pain is important to me, a creature's pain is important to it. One should not take precedence over the other simply because I can. Speciesism, prejudice favoring one's own species. All right, we've seen that. Okay, so here's where it gets difficult, more difficult. So colonialism and, uh, quote, the savages, the barbarians, the others, um, from the Enlightenment, when, when suddenly the European uh, conquistadors and persons from Portugal, the United Kingdom, and Spain and France were going off on the, the era, what they call the era of exploration, and quote, finding the, quote, new world, which was really a world in which, let's say, the Mayans had been, had, had really the, uh, the largest town, uh, much larger than London, for example, in Mexico. Uh, but so the European conquistadors are saying, who are these people? They don't look like us, they don't smell like us, they don't talk like us. So th th there's some kind of other thing. Um, and you can hear Jefferson, for example, is talking about this, about, uh, again, his own rationality about uh, how and why he can keep enslaved persons. But once we sorted out that humans were exceptions to, to other animals, we also started sorting out and hierarchizing animals into higher and lower, okay? Um, this is a collar. It says on it, it's, it's 1857, and it says, it says on it, for donkeys, mules, and dark African niggers, I quote. Um, so the 
the point here is that the domesticity of animals and the domesticity of human animals uh, is something that we have learned together. The dreaded comparison by Marjor Mar Marjorie Spiegel, human and animal, animal enslavement. Um, it's an astonishing book and it's not very long and it basically says everything that we already know but often choose not to think about. Eternal Treblinka, Our Treatment of Animals and the Holocaust. An astonishing book also, again, because he does not um, withhold any kind of, you know, he doesn't apologize for what is in fact is a historical way in which persons have taken care of or not taken care of other persons, how persons have subjugated other persons. Stock market, stockyard, in the lower left, from the city, city council, New York, 1711. That all Negro and Indian slaves that are let out to hire be hired at the market house at the Wall Street slip. Stocks, stockyard. It all goes back. And by, and by the way, here you see all Negro and Indian slaves. Uh, the, the kind of the politic that I have been pushing in a number of different places is that there is never a mention made of the indigenous first persons of the Americas and the enslavement that was part uh, and through the through the, the colonies. And so even the, the esteemed 1619 project, if, for example, and I, I talk about that often from the New York Times, it says that enslavement started in 1619. Well, as a matter of fact, enslavement started in 1495 with Columbus taking five boats of indigene back to Queen Isabel and getting 10% for their slaves as enslaved. So, so here's back to Jeremy Bentham again. While the 13 colonies were codifying persons of property in the Constitution, sorry, that's what it is, um, the French were freeing their enslaved, Haiti in particular. Bentham writes this. The French have already discovered that the blackness of the skin is no reason a human being should be abandoned without redress. Again, a legal philosopher thinking about the position of the law. It may one day come to be recognized, again another legal expression, that the number of the legs, the velocity of the skin, are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. What else is it that should trace the inseparable line? Is it the faculty of reason? But a full-grown dog is beyond comparison a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or a week. But suppose the case were otherwise, what would it avail? The question is not can they reason, but can they suffer? Jeremy Bentham is, is probably, and I would say this also, one of the earliest uh, feminists in terms of uh, e equality of race and equality of gender. Very quickly, Darwin argues there's no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental facilities. The difference in mind between men and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. The love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man. We have seen that the senses and intuitions, the various emotions and facilities, such as love, memory, attention, and curiosity, intuition and reason, of which man boasts, may be found in an incipient and even sometimes a well-developed condition in the lower animals. Back with um, de Tocqueville. And again, you would not, you will never see this in, in your, your Charles Darwin books. Animals whom we have made our slaves, we do not like to consider our equal. Again, Darwin, but can we feel sure that an old dog with an excellent memory and some power of imagination, as shown by his dreams, never reflects on his past pleasures in the chase? And this would be a form of self-consciousness. This is in 1872. Who can say what cows feel when they are surrounded and stare intently on a dying or dead companion? Well, actually, we do know what cows feel and think because there are videos, stolen videos, from these places in which uh, a, a young calf is being taken from the mother. And why is the mother pregnant to begin with? Because she's a milking cow. And so the, the, the calf is born and immediately taken away and becomes, you, you, know your, you know your history about where it becomes, and you can hear the panic in the mother's voice. So when we start thinking about personhood, how do we expand the, the category of human? And we're not talking necessarily about, necessarily, let's not talk about human, let's talk about 
personhood because personhood is something that's very legal and we we all you know for example that corporations have legal rights and that there are mountains in different places in India gives gives Indian uh, gives uh, uh, legal rights to Gandhi to the to the, to the rivers do animals deserve some kind of personhood persons and things Roman law do animals deserve some kind of I don't know what we don't know yet what might these rights be so when we think about expanding the moral circle, where there's an image I'll show you in a moment, what are our moral obligations to animal? And this is Andrew Lindsay's book, of How Human, Why Animal Suffering Matters. And Peter Singer, as we said, on what animals deserve ethically, they deserve equal consideration. Coco the gorilla, who astonishingly knew a 2,000 word vocabulary, and who passed last year, maybe two years ago. Cecilia and Chuko, freed by writ of habeas corpus. These are two uh, apes, great apes. And Cecilia was also, I think, 19, uh, 2018. So, so the expanding circle, and this is a, a William Lucky, and he talks about that the, the, the progress of a moral species, humanity unfolds more and unfolds. And a few generations, though, slaves are excluded from our society, women were devalued, Animals are much greater disadvantage in the struggle for moral equality because unlike enslaved and women, they're not of our species and cannot fight for their own cause. So Singer's most recent book, not recent, but the um, recent take on this, The Expanding Circle, Eth Ethics and Social Biology in 1981. So you have this, uh, there's a basic present people to you, distant people, future people, animals. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson has a book actually that uh, President Obama liked a lot, The Ministry of the Future, which is essentially um, that there's an ethical, uh, that there's a chair in the cabinet for the ministry to the future, taking care of, of, of that future p persons have legal claim on us. It's an interesting book. Animals, living things, species, back in 1970, there was a Supreme Court case in California about the, um, the legal rights we owe to trees different species, ecosystems. Um, kin and kind. The question again, I would say in a particular class, you know, uh, one child hits another child, don't hit him, he's your brother. So why do we have to say, why do we have to make that relationship? Why can't you say just don't hit him or her? Why do we always have to do the kinship thing? Because that's where ethics starts. And this is Peter uh, Singer's, um, that kinship and kindness are cognate for a reason. Now, and then again, the question of the, the moral claim. Do you give a moral claim to your children? Do they have a claim on your morality? Yes, they do. Do they return it? Can they return it? No, they can't. Um, does that bother you? It may, but as a matter of fact, uh, as a parent or as a caregiver, even as a teacher, in, in the various ways that we, we engage in a kind of ethical transaction with other persons who are not able to return that, uh, like watering your plants, for example. You know. um, a Borneo ape. So if we use, for personhood, if we use the question of, well, um, homo sapiens, uh, homo faber, the, the maker, we use tools. And these are just a few animals that use tools, chimpanzees, crows, orangutans, elephants, dolphins, sea, sea otters, gorillas, and octopi. And if we don't believe it, you guys can Google all this all you want. Um, it, it may surprise you. Okay. Elephant scratching its back. Octopus catching dinner. Okay. Um, orangutan, or, or monkey, sorry, um, going to use that big large rock to make him snuff dinner. Um, the crow, using a straw. Okay, there's the crow again, using a straw. Altruism, oh well, no, we can't be, have moral contracts with animals because they're not altruistic. And you know, CNN and People Magazine now do this every day, you're gonna, you're gonna find animal pictures of animals that are taking care of other animals. The Norwegian black rat, now this is the third or fourth time we've talked about this, brown rat. Um, researchers say that they're one of the most altruistic species because they will bring in the young of other species and take care of them. P 
personness, not personhood, personness, expanding of the moral circle. And here's where it gets more difficult. Who defines a person? Is it our own particular shifting boundary? We talk about the humanities, 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 but as a matter of fact, probably most people on this evening that now, at one point in our history, not too long ago, were not what we would call human. They were not, uh, if you're gendered, not male, if you were gendered, not raced. Um, so the constitution in terms of women and non-European and enslaved persons of all varieties, uh, it gets really complicated. What kinds of persons are there? And again, there's legal persons and countries have, have um, the indigenous people of New Zealand accord a certain kind of legal uh, personhood to their mountains. So what's at stake? What's, why is the legal site important? Anyone here with the title Mr. and Mrs.? That there was a time when Mrs. did not have legal site in a court. That is to say, she needed coverture from her husband. This is why you would see up until the 60s, at least, the 70s, maybe still, um, ads in the paper that would say, ads of this day, that I am responsible only for my own particular, my own particular bills. So, uh, and we tend to forget the incremental nature of this. Um, watching our child, for example, when does a fetus uh, assume a legal status? Is a fetus a human being? Okay, is it a person? And you know, the people in class get their, everyone's in a twist because we think about these things in a sentimental kind of way, but we also do not pay any. Uh, the, the mothers here understand that a child does not have legal recognition for at least a month. That's when you get your social security card, and that's when you get your own insurance. And that a, 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 li a live birth, it's 72 hours beyond. So personhood is not always simple or guaranteed. When is a human not a person? And we have been in situations in, in hospital beds when um, a, some person whom we, we love is no longer a person. And we hear the, the kind of the awful way that we talk about um, some of these situations. I, I won't, won't have to talk about that here. But anecdotally, we understand there's some factor, some quality and, and while, as Peter Singer says, we will accord care and dignity and respect to persons who are no longer persons, that's more or less a quote from Peter Singer, um, but it's also clear that they are no longer persons as we know human persons. That doesn't change our care for them. So what traits should be remembered? Reason, emotion, ability to talk, ability to remember? The University of Texas, uh, they have a wonderful ethics school. A moral agent is a person who has the ability to discern right from wrong and to be held accountable for his or her own actions. Anecdotally, your doggy, your cat knows when she or he has done some fallacious thing like eat the mail. Moral agents have a moral responsibility not to cause unjustified harm. Moral agency is assigned only to those who can be held responsible for the, to their actions. Again, I come back to persons who have enslaved in, in their history, uh, women, children, uh, when do we achieve, we achieve our legal majority, and why is it that, for example, that we can kill before that legal majority, but we can't drink liquor before that legal majority? It's really a checkered map. Wikipedia, just to go real low, non-human is any entity displaying some but not enough human characteristics to be considered a human. Now, they don't talk about moral agent. The term has been used in a variety of contexts and may refer to objects that have been developed within human intelligence, such as robots or vehicles. Um, and actually, what is that man's name who has the, who runs Amazon, who basically uh, has a, a, a robot dog? So Kant's definition of a, of a person is interesting, and Kant is one of the chief designers of Enlightenment thinking, um, and who I dare, who I can say, I'll give you a quote from Kant. He says, that man was completely stupid, and you can tell why he's completely stupid, you can see by the color of him. Enlightenment uh, philosophies were raced and gendered. They're colonial, they're European. That's how they start. And we can, we can do the no but around them, but we should be asking ourselves in our school curriculums, why are we, for example, doing this kind of thinking when, when possibly it's not doing as much of a service? So Kant defines a person in the groundwork as not as a member of the species Homo sapiens, 
but rather as a rational being, quote, whose nature already marks him as an end in itself. That is a something that may not be used merely as a means and hence so far limits all choice and is an object of respect. Here is the law. How do you read it? What's a favorite quote from mine, my friend Jesus, to the Pharisees? So, the idea that the entities in the world may be for moral purposes divided into the two categories of things and persons comes down to us from Roman law. In Roman law, a persona, a mask, comes to signify a juridical being of will, a person. Things, ferre nature, are of a wild nature. They may be claimed and owned as property, and wait for this, it's interesting, by having the being of a will come and place his hand, in this case, his, on that. So the Me Too movement underscores this notion that tactility, putting a hand on another creature, uh, at, at, in some particular point in Roman law, signified ownership. We may have forgotten that. But in ethics, a person is an object of respect, to be valued for her own sake, and never to be used as a mere means to an end, while the thing has only a derivative value. And of course, even with Warren from Aristotle, only freeborn citizens counted in this. And this is where I start talking about John's Gospel and King James' Gospel, and when Jesus says, I no longer, I no longer treat you as, as uh, servants, uh, King James, the King James Version basically took the Greek word doulat, which is slave, and transliterated it to servants all the way along, so that the language through the Old and the New Testament about enslavement, if, if you know the language, there it is. So why is Uncle Tom's Cabin here, Life Among the Lowly? The first subtitle, as I said before, in 1852, was The Man Who Was a Thing. So we'll see here, we're, going to, we're coming to the end. I'm, I'm a little, it's gonna take a bit more longer than I wanted to do tonight, but the this notion of uh, res nature and ferre nature, things of nature and things that are free. Um, as the federal judge in New York talks about the, uh, the, the chimpanzee uh, who was brought in by habeas corpus and, and, and demanded freedom, and the judge says, you know, we're, we're doing it a disservice. It's not a thing. It's clearly not a thing. It's not a person. Maybe. Is it? We'll see. So the bifurcation is unfortunate because it seems to leave us with no alternative, either person or thing. Yet some of the entities that rise to the most vexing ethical problems are exactly the ones that are not comfortable. Uh, and, and again, the human history of our own people. One day you're 15, the next day you can drive and kill somebody. One day you're a woman, the next day you have the proposition, excuse me, you have a, uh, Amendment 19. Uh, one day you're enslaved and then suddenly you have a, a, an Emancipation Day. Um, it's the process of the law that does the change. That's why the legal apparatus that we have seen, um, I'll say it this way, misfire so often, even in the last couple of weeks, uh, it needs to be reckoned with. So, so for various different reasons, it seems inappropriate to categorize a fetus, non-human, per animal, the environment, or an object of beauty as a person, but they're not just means. Eastern culture has no difference, no difficulty with this. Uh, how does the thing become a person? December 2013, lawyer Steve Wise, president of the Non-Human Rights Project, uh, very worthy of your donations, shows the world how an animal can be transitioned from a thing without rights to a non-human person with legal protection. Now watch this, this is gonna get interesting. Legal personhood is not synonymous with human being. A non-human person refers to an entity that possesses some rights for limited legal purposes. Corporations, for example. Sentience might be the characteristic necessary for granting legal rights to non-human species, not necessarily to corporations. All right. In 1772, a Negro slave was taken from the colonies and taken to England where he sought his freedom. It became a cause celeb. He couldn't go to court himself, but he could be brought to court. Because he was a slave, he couldn't be brought to court. But on a habeas corpus. So he was represented by an attorney 
on a, on a habeas corpus, which basically says you have the body or present the body. So it's a, a habeas corpus is a protocol for someone who has no way to achieve a legal recognition. There's no attorney or no counselor in the same way that, for, for example, Frederick Douglass, when he was writing his particular very smart books, um, he always had to be at the beginning of the book, uh, like Mary Rowlandson, uh, any gendered woman had to have a male basically introduce the book and close it in the same way that Douglas had to have a white man introduce the book and close it. So in other words, these the, the, here in, the, in terms of the court, the habeas corpus, which is how this guy got into court. So uh, one, of the, one of the factors that, that really put a pressure on the southern colonies to separate from Britain was this notion that um, British law did not recognize enslavement. Well, they, they knew it didn't, and it has, has never had, you know, my house is my, my, my kingdom, my uh, castle. But so they understood that they could not depend upon um, the mother country, England, to protect them. Okay. So Fahey says that the failure is to grapple with the issues of the person amounts to a refusal to confront the injustice for the question of the animal's legal personhood and rights. He says, this constitutes a deep dilemma of a policy that demands our attention. Whatever side you want to fall on it, um, the, the hand on someone's back, according to Roman law, suggests a kind of ownership and thinginess, dominion, because we can. So as a matter of fact, uh, we have a creature here, and we're looking at this particular creature, Anecdotally, we can say, and we call it persons, and we, we give them presents at Christmas, we do this and the other thing. Um, we call them our children. They're not children, they're dependents. Uh, but what are they? They're not things. Quote, to treat a chimpanzee as if he or she had no right to liberty, protected by habeas corpus. Again, the habeas corpus is the legal protocol by which a creature gains oversight, by which a woman is able to come into court when she would otherwise not have any access to the legal process. That's why she would have an attorney speak for her. Is to regard the chimpanzee as entirely lacking independent worth, mere resource for human use, a thing the value of which consists exclusively in its usefulness to others. Instead, we should consider whether a chimpanzee is an individual with an inherent value who has the right to be treated with respect. This is the video that was documentary on it. Um, Judge Fahey later writes more. In the interval since we first denied leave to the Non-Human Rights Project, I have struggled with whether this was the right decision, although I now I concur in the court's decision to deny leave to appeal. I continue to question whether this was right to deny leave in the first instance. The issue of whether a non-human animal has a fundamental right to liberty protected by a writ of habeas corpus is profound and far-reaching. We'll see that certain governments in Europe, for example, are already moving that way. It speaks to our relationships with all the life around us, and ultimately, we will not be able to ignore it. Well, it may be argued that a chimpanzee is not a person, there is no doubt that it's not merely a thing. Regardless of how wide its scope, personhood will always define itself through contrast with an excluded other. No matter how wide the scope, personhood will always define itself through contrast with an excluded other. Everyone here this evening at some point has been invited legally into personhood. And there's all kinds of rites of passage, whether we call them bar mitzvahs or, or Christian uh, baptisms, or whether we, we call them, you know, your your 16th party or, or whatever. The, what there's all everywhere. There's a legal change. There's also some kind of public awareness and satisfaction of that. In this sense, even as a broader conception of personhood validates others' beings as worthy of moral consideration, it does so by evaluating whether their essence sufficiently resembles our own. There's where specious bias comes in. Any attempt to frame a set of criteria for a person begins with, are they like us? Axiomatic, before the Nazis could legally repudiate persons, they had first to delegalize them. 
dehumanize them. We ourselves are rarely completely sure in our own personhood. We will say, oh, I wasn't in my right mind that particular day, or I'm not in my head today, or possession is always qualified. And personhood is always under constraint. Each culture guards and enforces the rubrics and rhetorics of personness. Um, Judge Jackson, five, 2021 survey, 5% of American attorneys are black Americans. 5%. One wonders why there has not been a black woman judge. One wonders that of the 115 judges, something like 108 have been white male. Personhood is always dependent upon are they like us. Masan's book, very important, good. It's always been comforting to the dominant group to assume that those in subservient positions do not suffer or feel pain as keenly or at all, thanks to what Jefferson says, so that they can be abused and exploited without guilt and with impunity. The history of prejudice is notable for assertions that lower classes and other races are relatively insensitive. Uh, I could give you some astonishing medication, some astonishing statistics um, of demographics at medical school of what medical students think about different populations. At every one point this evening, every one of us has been outside the circle of legally defined personhood, whether biologically, culturally, religiously, economically, historically, or nationally. Cecilia, 2017. Freed by a judge on habeas corpus. The only way she could get into that court was if someone brought a writ of habeas corpus to the court in her name. We recognize that primates are subjects of the life and that they are fundamental rights and questions that human beings possess. But to accept and understand once and for all that these beings are living, sentient creatures who are subject to rights and who possessed, among others, the fundamental right to be born, live, grow, and to die according to their species. This is the first few steps that this creature takes from this. Uh, an interesting side, um, for those of you who follow this, uh, the DNA now studies say that uh, chimpanzees, the pan group, uh, are really, they should be in the homo group, that they're more aligned to primates like ourselves. Oh, there are cousins. That's going to change the way we think about them. Uh, this is just happening now. This is not the elephant in question. India, for example, every species has a right to life and security, the Supreme Court holds, subject to the law of the land, which includes depriving its life out of human necessity. Article 21, while safeguarding the rights of humans, protects life, and the word life has been given an expanded definition, and any disturbance from the basic environment, which includes all form of life. Spain, probably one of the first to do this. Parliament approves a measure to extend human rights to gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans, becoming the first country to explicitly acknowledge the legal rights of non-humans. Uh, I'm moving quickly because I know it's now 6.30 and I will take five more minutes of your time, please. Uh, th this is a very funny situation. Uh, Edward, take as long as you need. Okay, we are, uh, this is a, you can Google this, it's, it's a video. Um, these creatures, there, there are laws in place in India where you protect the animals, and so these creatures were, were walking down the street and they were basically like deer, uh, chewing on the plants and things as they went through. Um, they were, the, the owner of the plants had them arrested. They were taken to jail, they spent three days in jail, and then they were released by a court order. So if, if you want to see a hilarious video of kind of these uh, donkeys and horses doing a perp walk. This is it. So, so to, to 
close this particular section. To Jane Goodall, she relates this during a lecture at the American, American Museum of History. She was working and working at a, a medical research facility. At the facility, a chimpanzee in a cage had been apparently been other, either home raised or otherwise taught sign language. And you can Google that. That is a matter of fact that sign language is one of the one of the material now that our people are using to communicate with with uh, the primates. Uh, the chimpan that was sitting and signing over and over again in ASL a single message: "Help me." This is Coco again, renowned as one of the most intellectual apes in history beloved by millions of people around the world. Under Patterson's tutelage, the, her, 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 what do you call a trainer, doctor, uh, companion, she learned more than a thousand words in sign language and came to understand over 2,000 words spoken to her in English. Um, there are numerous uh, YouTube videos and documentaries of a number of these animals. And if, one, if, if, if perhaps this is a new topic that people have not seen, um, so I'll spend 45 minutes watching a couple of them and it will change your mind. So are you, the original questions, you know, how do we think about animals? And, and I'm hoping that what we have done this afternoon, even in a small way, provides a way for each of us to perhaps move in a little different direction and, and, and perhaps think about things differently. And do we think about them? Well, um, yes, we do. And the, the first thing we're going to do, we're going we're to go to Whole Foods and we're going to say, why does that chicken not look like a chicken? There, it, well, there was a time when one could go not, not so long ago, but now they are put together in these little plastic things. And one, um, again, as the question I asked earlier about the the, the factory farms of, of for chickens and other animals, why we are not allowed to see what is happening in there? How would our lives change if we started thinking about our relationships with them? Um, I, I, my husband and I. Um, Stop eating meat when one day we spent um, traveling t for some time behind a Purdue chicken truck. And, and you say to yourself, well, I just had never thought about it this way. Well, once one sees about it, so what do we need from animals? And do, do we know that? What do we need from the, from the dogs and the cats that we have? And um, what, what do we need from the, the animals that we feed in our neighborhoods? And, are they ours? What do we owe them? Is there something that is generative about our relationships to other animals? I think that for most people there is, that if we see an animal, probably we're better with animals than we are with homeless. So all sorts of perplexing but interesting ethical questions of how we respond to animals, you know, what, what, going down here to the park, into Constitution Park in D.C., and animals chasing the pigeons around, and you know, I'm going over to the kids and saying, you know what, uh, they live here, this is their home. And of course, the parents get on my case for doing that, but uh, perhaps the children should understand early on that we share the planet. Why do we need to separate from them? That is to say, why are we exceptional? Uh, what kind of work do they do? And by that I mean the psychological work, the emotional work, the spiritual work. Uh, you know that we have our teams, that we have totems, we have. So there is a kind of spiritual connection, uh, creation stories of Rome and of rise of places, Romulus and Remus, and we we know that uh, we have no problem thinking about the kind of the spiritualized ancestry that animals give us. How are animals represented? Who speaks for them? Who's going to present the habeas corpus that that brings these animals into a legal oversight? site over in the sense that where a judge can say we now may need to change the law for this. Is there something distinctive about humanity that justifies the ideas that moral status for humans but non-humans do not? The more one thinks and moves into this area, one's gonna see that, you know what, there, there's no there's nothing that justifies it. But then you're gonna go, well no but but you know what I know I like my have my like my McDonald's chicken or whatever it is I'm eating. Um, we're providing an answer to this question has become increasingly important among philosophers as well as those outside of philosophy, ourselves here, that everyone here has a philosophical think about this. Interested in our treatment, not only of non-human animals, 
But as a matter of fact, when we're saying their names, we're saying the names of the people that we live with. Because I think that uh, de Tocqueville, and, and actually uh, Locke would say this, he said, you know what, you, you can't, you cannot, you need to teach a child to be careful with animals because they will do as they see and they will do this to other human beings. Um, Locke spoke better than he, than he actually had in terms of his own enslavement practice. But, but as a matter of fact, that um, as we are talking to sentience and some kind of rapprochement between ourselves and non-human animals, that perhaps it's helping us think about the animals whom we live with, uh, who share the same sentience, the same needs. So for some, answering this question will enable us to better understand the nature of human beings and the proper scope of our moral obligations, part of which is we can't do everything. This is true. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuro, neuro, neuro not anatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of consciousness, along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Francis Crick Memorial. Consciousness in humans and non-human animals, this was in 212. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, mammals, birds, many other creatures, including octopi, also possess these neurological substrates. You know, for example, you look at the, the raven on your porch and you're going, why is that raven picking up that penny? The raven has no use for that particular penny, but he certainly wants that shiny object. You know, one has to think. Um, sentient species. This little creature here, knows as many words as Coco. This little creature here is probably smarter than most land mammals. These creatures here are arguably smarter than this creature whom we love. You know those cats are not up here. I apologize for that. Um, 18, 18, 1757, Linnaeus calculates that the human is in fact an animal. And this is an image from the Smithsonian Human Origins Project. And this Human Smithsonian Origin Project makes a point, and I th I'm gonna say it here in terms of the Ukraine situation. Um, there were originally 17 species of, of, of the human being. Now there's only one left. And then uh, the Smithsonian Project says, somewhat lamely, the others disappeared. Well. Um, a few lines down, the, human, the Smithsonian Project says, uh, human species are very aggressive. So we return where we started. How do we come to understand that humans are in some way unique in the world? And, and sentimental images like this, non-human animals are more like us than unlike. And this major voices of science and philosophy confirm. But that likeness, yet unlikeness, is the problem. All right, my friends, uh, Robert, I have a few bi few images here. Uh, okay. This is Peter Sagan. Let me just go real quick onto this. This is Peter Take your Sagan. time. Uh, Jim Mason, The Animal Question, Carol Adams, The Sexual Politics of Meat. Uh, this is a, a 1987 book, and it should be read by everybody, I think. Uh, this is a new Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can you pull that back up in case someone wants to take a picture or a screenshot? Okay, there you go. All right, thank you. So these are our, our, our sources of, of books that uh, I don't always agree with him, and he's, he's doing more of an ethnography. He's kind of asking questions. Um, but the, 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 the project is no longer one of nostalgia that we're doing, but one of utopia, that looking at a world and how do we put it together with all these particular creatures. Okay. And I'm, I want to thank everyone this evening for the good work that we do and you do with us. Robert, take it away. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Edward. So my friend Patty and I are gonna go through the questions and send them off to you. Appreciate the information. I posted the 
while Edward was speaking, I was curious, as I always am when he talks. Um, so if you're interested, about 5% of Americans are vegetarian. And that, according to Gallup, and that was a study done four years ago or five years ago. And according to Gallup, that number hasn't really changed all that much in the past 20 years, which is interesting because we've had, you know, meatless Monday and all that kind of stuff. Um, women in the United States are much more likely to be vegetarian than men, 6% versus 4%. And then let's see, there was one other tidbit I want. Oh, Canadians, people in the UK and Mexicans are much more likely to be vegetarian than Americans. I thought that was interesting. Robert, and, can I pause you for a second? Yeah, uh, sure. The gendering, the gendering of advertisement for meat, for example, just Google that. Google you know, that's a, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It is kind of more of a macho thing. Go eat a big steak, you man, you. You will not see a woman in a, in a meat ad. It's not, they, I mean, it's a very, it's a very sp specific thing. Um, so the, 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 the way that milk and other dairy and other um, animal products are gendered, especially around meat, but anyway, mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, no, I appreciate you chiming in with that. And then also from the same Gallup study, um, people of color in America are 9% uh, vegetarian and non-people of color are 3%. And then as far, and it really skews a lot age-wise as well. So people that are 34 and under, 7% uh, are vegetarian and people that are 55 and older, only 2% are vegetarian. So anyway, just thought I'd give you some data behind that. So thanks. Um, so yeah, there were a few questions and let me send these off to you. Here's interesting. Um, it says, why doesn't the Bible, the Torah, etc., advocate vegetarianism or veganism? So I, good question. Does the Bible say anything about treatment of animals? I, I do. And actually, Robert, do you remember my first, my first slide? Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 through 29. He says, every green, the text in the original, not in my translation, every green and seed-bearing fruit I give to you as meat. Now, meat is the King James version for food. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, the, the the point that I made on the, on that second week in terms of dominion is that we get a, a a freedom for meat eating from a mistranslation of Genesis. Okay. That the original there are two gener there are two accounts of uh, creation in Genesis, and the first one essentially says that for your food you shall have all green seed bearing products. Okay, excellent. So yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to type those in the chat. One of my favorite parts of doing these programs is hearing what all of you think, and especially because people bring up uh, things that I hadn't thought of or considered, like the, for instance, the uh, gendering of the meat advertisements. Um, same person asked, why do religious texts distinguish between clean, like example, lamb, and unclean, example, pig animals? Is this related to animal rights, human rights, or something else? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm... <clears throat> I'm not com completely conversant on, on kosher, but one can say that some basic sorts of things, for example, that some an animal was, was clean if it was uh, biologically coherent, for example, so that if, 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 a, if a creature had hooves uh, and not paws, it was unclean. Um, so that cleanliness, again, I'm, I'm gonna, you go back to Mary Douglas and sociologists about this, but very generally, uh, issues around clean, cleanliness and kosher depended it was, for, was for basically for health and safety of the community that there were certain certain products or meats that that could not be eaten for safety and that they, they were not clean so so if you want to go back to for example why some animals an animal that was that swam in the water but was found on land would be not clean so if there was something uh, categorically not right with the way the, the creature presented itself, it would be a not clean animal. Okay, very good. And then here's another interesting question. This is from Paula. What is your opinion about insects? Those are considered pests, such as roaches, for example, and those that can transmit diseases, such as mosquitoes and ticks. How do they fit into all this? Well, I'm sorry to be, to be this direct. I mean, human beings transit diseases too, and I, um, I don't think of I don't think of insects as pets. And if one is Eastern, and we didn't spend any time at all in Eastern traditions, but for example, uh, if you want to Google uh, Jainism and Hinduism, for example, a, a, a Jainist is is this person who will have a broom, walking down the street, so that they are brushing away, uh, the, the 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 fact of ahimsa, do no harm. 
Now, I might, as, you know, in terms of my own kind of Western commodity, uh, kind of a queer professor upbringing, call myself, uh, you know, do no harm. Uh, and this is the medical kind of uh, the Hippocratic oath, do no harm. But ahimsa in the, in the Hindu is to do no harm to any life, including insects. Okay. And then let's see, here's a question. Here's, um, this is actually more of a comment from Benita. Benita, I appreciate you were chiming in a lot of interesting thoughts. She said, um, from when you were discussing this earlier, a cage is just that, a cage, no matter how large. Um, let's see. And then... Hold on, I'm scrolling through these. Ed, were you surprised that the percentage of vegetarianism hasn't really increased in the United States in the past 20? That really shocked me. I would have just assumed that it's gone up at least a little bit um, during the past uh, 20 years or so, but apparently that's not the case at all. We need to change the narrative in the same way that I said yesterday about, about and not only is the, the subject the subject, we're talking about how we talk about things. For example, you went from homosexuality here to same sex. This, for example, okay, that and it's how something is talked about that I think that veganism is, 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 is one of those particular examples. So while I would not use the word vegan or even vegan, we'll talk about uh, ethically food conscious to try and open it up and to try and think about it in a different kind of way. Right. Now, Robert, uh, you know, I have not talked about, but I do have one of these presentations just on food itself, and we can talk about that later. But Oh, yeah, no, that would be fabulous. I mean, it's an important topic, and you keep bringing up uh, things, I know for myself personally, that I never really considered um, before. So, no, that would be great. Um, Patty, if you've seen any other questions that I've missed, feel free to uh, chime in. What about, here's an interesting question from... Dolores, she says, or asks, are people who are vegetarian eating that way mainly for their own health or for animal rights? I know um, just Dolores, myself, some people eat vegetarian just because um, for, you know, calorie intake type ideas more than say animal rights. And, um, and so I guess like, it really varies a lot. Again, that's gendered bodybuilding hoo-ha, Robert. I mean, um, in the sense that one can get the same amount of protein. There are any number of uh, vegan bodybuilders who are these huge creatures. And you know, look at a horse, for example. A horse gets the way it does. It's all it's eating is oatmeal, oats. I mean, so. Um, oh yeah, no, I I'm, I'd agree with you. I guess I guess let's think like you go out with a friend, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a woman friend. It could be a man or woman. And so like, oh, we're, okay, I'm gonna I would I would get a hamburger, but I'm on a diet, so I'm gonna get a salad. That kind of thing. Well, and, the, you know, the are, they, are they doing it because they care about that the cow got killed? Well, no, not really. They, they just want less calories and assume that a salad is healthier than eating a hamburger. But it's also the case, once you once you point out to somebody that where that milk comes from and where that veal comes from, and once you figure out where, how that you got that particular chicken, um, that suddenly puts a different spin on how they eat, for example. And you, with, a, with a plant-based diet, for example, now there's all kinds of original burgers and there's, there's the impossible burgers. There is no particular reason we need to be killing animals for this. And again, back to the, the thing on, on, in terms of biomass, something like 80% of biomass in the world right now are cattle animals or husband animals. And this is an astonishing perspective. So if you Google the percentage of biomass to human beings, in terms of uh, in the world, and you're looking at uh, 1,000, 10,000 years ago, it was exactly the opposite. So the mm -hmm. most of the biomass and that what we call wild animals, there's really very few of them in comparison. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, that was a slide I had a, a couple weeks ago. You know, it's from the very beginning of this program, Ed, um, and I actually wrote it down before you got to the part of hierarchy, but this has been a recurrent theme uh, lately that keeps hitting me that we have this tendency to, whether it's lapse or just instinctive or what, we tend to think in about everything in hierarchical, in a hierarchical way. Is I don't know if you have an answer for this, but do you have any guess as to whether this might just be a kind of lazy habit or? It's enlightenment philosophy. This is what uh, Kant means by rational and reason. I mean, and I do say this in class oftentimes that I said, it to, I have a teaching course right now on, on ethics and, and myth. And I, I, I say, look, okay, if you're going to be doing ethics and myth on, say, Hawaiian ethics and myth, please go pre-colonial. Go back before the time the U.S. 
um, business corporations took over the Republic of Hawaii. For example, stay away from encyclopedias, stay away from cultural tourism books. So the kind of thing what you're talking about, and I completely and thank you for I don't uh, the thank you for joining in over this, uh, is that all my comments tonight were, are Western. And then when we start thinking about that, we, we think about other animals in a very kind of Western kind of way. Um, I'm looking at this little creature here sitting here looking at me. And I'm going to, you know, uh, he, I've invited it into, into our house. It's going to do what it wants, and my husband is not going to appreciate that lots of times. But your, your point is clear, is that much of what I said earlier about commodity and culture, there are different ways of evaluating these kinds of materials. And that in a different world, um, the lives we would live with non-human animals, even calling ourselves human animals, would be a start. Hmm. I thought it was interesting when you were talking. Oh, go ahead, Patty. Oh, no, the other thing that I thought of several times during this whole program uh, was some years ago listening to, um, oh, the, the mythology guy. I, the name was just, I lost the name. Um, Joseph um, Campbell. Yes, thank you. Um, talking about um, like, tribal or Native American cultures or, or less evolved cultures in our sense of the word evolved, but they made a religious or a very spiritual ceremony about the fact that they understood they were killing and eating animals for their preservation. And I, I think we've gotten so far away from that. I mean, there's this idea that, well, you give thanks before you eat. Not a lot of people do that anymore, but are we truly giving thanks there's, for there, anything that's given up its life for us? There's an, there's a, a what we call neocarnism, and you can kind of Google that, and you can kind of Google Michael Pollan, and Michael Pollan is a New Yorker, New York <clears throat> Times writer, and you know he, he, he basically got me started thinking about a lot of this. I have less respect for him now. He, he has a, you know, an omnivore's dilemma. He's coming out now through neocarnism, and he's saying essentially that, that, you know, I kill what I eat and I pray over it. And so I'm claiming some kind of, and I'm going to suggest that there's a bit more of gender here happening. Um, and that what we need to do is unpack the gendering of the way human persons consider that they need to eat. Just as we need to unpack gender from basically the ways we are in the world. That whatever we might be saying about how value-free now gender is, you can be whatever you want and however you want to be, it's not the case. Right. I, I can see a point in thanking a higher power for your food, but are we thanking the people who are in every way and shape sacrificing to provide that food, including the animals themselves. Well, that's what I meant by the eth one ethically food conscious. That is that if, if, if you know, my pizza is value, is, is ethically free for the, for the, for the tomato uh, and organic, that is, is it, uh, if, if no animals were harmed in the making of this pizza, how are the animals who picked it? Are we taking care of them? Peter Singer basically responded to that point uh, of, of thanking the higher power. He says, well, you know, perhaps if you gave the animal the choice of whether uh, she or he was going to sacrifice its life to you. And by the way, she or he, gendering and, and race are the categories brought into the Americas from um, the European colonialists. It was a very different situation. Yeah, Edward, is, I thought it was real. Oh, yeah, this is just massive, Ed. I really want to thank you for, I mean, all of the programs you're doing, even the one yesterday I'm still thinking about. So just really <laughs> thank you. I keep telling Edward his programs are very thoughtful. Um, provoking. The th thing that I thought was interesting, one of them was I used to work, I grew up in Detroit and I used to work for Ford Motor Company. And so in Detroit, you could actually go on a tour of an auto factory. That's something that they, you know, Ford Motor Company would love to have you come down and see how they build the Mustang or the F-150. So they kind of show off that. And you contrast that with when you were talking about the, you know, the chicken plants and how come they're, you know, they're not identified as that and there's no windows. They don't want you looking in. I used to have to visit um, in the area that had a chicken plant and the people there told me that it pays really well because that's really uh, that's traumatic type of work for yeah, people and, have and to I work there to the point. you know that Henry Ford his walk through the uh, the his walk through the uh, the, the stockyards were, the, were what got him his mind in terms of the mechanical factory and it mm -hmm. was that particular factory model that was um, used by the Nazi regime uh, in Dachau 
Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So cool. kind of interesting that not only did they want it closed off, but in this, at least in this particular case, the only place that you could work in this um, town was either at Walmart or at the chicken plant. And the chicken plant paid really well because they knew you know, it was a traumatic work. And but yeah, why do why don't they show that what's going on in there? If you go to if you go to Krispy Kreme, at least some of them, you can see how the donuts are rolling up the assembly line. You want here, and that's a that's a telling point. If you want to see, if you want to take ethical responsibility for for how your food is made, you're not going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can also, to contrast it, you can go place and pick your own strawberries, or you can go to um, sometimes restaurants to be able to see like the cook actually making the stuff. So, um, just wanted to give you a shout out. I thought that was really interesting because I hadn't thought um, thought about that. If anyone else has any questions or comments, feel free to type those in the chat or the Q and A. Patty, any other questions that came up from anybody? Um. No, I was just noticing some, uh, Jane was asking if anybody else grew up on a farm, which I have to admit, I grew up on a working farm. So a lot of my understanding of animals and eating and food comes from that. But I, one of the things I wondered while you were speaking, Ed, was uh, we're talking about respecting both other people and animals. We are very underdeveloped in terms of respecting other human beings and a lot of us have absolutely no familiarity with what respecting animals means thank you for that it's true what about edward here was a question came in this was quite a while ago it said what books talk about the ethical circles that you recommend um robert i can give you a bibliography okay i had in other words i have a, that part of here i have a number of the slides that have uh I think the, the five top 10, to five, five books, for example, and I can give those to you and you can append Okay. Them. Okay. Yeah. I could, what I could do is I could um, email those out when I email people the link for the recording. So today's program is even recorded if you join us late or if you want to watch it again, or you know anyone else that would need to get this information, uh, which I can think of a couple of people that I know that could use this info. Um, I'll send out the link that'll have the um, YouTube recording for it, but it won't be till tomorrow because we have another um, program later tonight. So I won't be able to send that till tomorrow. But yeah, if you want to send that over, I'll be happy to forward that on. If I might say, make a point again, thank folks for, for being part of here. And you mentioned uh, uh, Joseph Campbell. He's a popularizer and he teaches, he's, he's doing what I am doing and I, I can quibble with my students about uh, Campbell will collapse all different myth systems into kind of one giant monomyth. Well, I would prefer to see how they are different and, and work that particular way. The work that I'm doing is, is, is popularizing material that's already out there. And Robert, as we have said before on the Enslaved series and on the White Supremacy series, um, this material is equally accessible i can give you the bibliographies for it mm -hmm. and, it, and then oh go ahead sorry that's all that's all oh i was going to give a shout out so jennifer also typed in a lot of interesting comments she said um recommended movie is my octopus teacher which is 2020 netflix documentary film directed uh, et cetera, et cetera. and then she also said it that's a hard that's a hard film to see um and so thanks jennifer appreciate that and then she was talking about the um <laughs> jennifer made an interesting Point. She was talking about, you know, for some people, really their only interaction with animals, if they don't have a pet, is going to the zoo. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's a good point. Like when, yeah, so maybe people don't care much about animals, but for many people that don't have any kind of animals, like when do they even interact with, you know, and it kind of kind of reminds me of like maybe the antebellum era up north. Like, yeah, people don't care about African Americans back then because they don't really um, interact with anyone that was African American if they were in the uh, northern states. About the about the Bantu uh, man who was put in the Bronx Zoo by um, uh, Madison Grant. The thing about zoos is one wonders why all these animals are so listless. Mm -hmm. I, and you can say there's a no but, uh, but there's a no but, but that they're there for education. Well, perhaps children and us should get our education from animals in different kinds of ways because. These animals are, are clearly to keep an elephant in a in a forty by forty container um, is clearly doing a disservice back to mm -hmm. to this creature's need to thrive. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Look through. We, we keep talking about food here. I can't tell you enough, Edward, how much you feed us. <laughs> I'm I'm somebody who really likes to think, but there are times after your programs that I'm like I feel so full of stuff I need to keep chewing on, if that makes any sense to you. <laughs> I, I, 
I'm sorry. I do throw a lot at that because, you know, it's, this oh, no, is, don't apologize. That's, no, that's don't, yes, I'm, I'm thanking you. <laughs> this is a nine week class and this is like you, um, and I would be very happy to refer you to the sources. OK, um, appreciate that. Eco what about you were also going to um, uh, oh, go ahead. Tom Reagan, um, Springer, uh, Springer, Singer, Peter Singer, Tom Reagan, Gary Francione, uh, Carol Adams and ecofeminism. And I would, would call myself an ecofeminist. Um, these are great places to get started. OK, um, why don't we wrap things up? Because we've been going for a while. And we do have uh, another program coming up in a little bit. But what were that you were going to talk about the um, program next week and then also the in-person walk that you're doing okay. in mid-April. All right, I would like to both again, thank Robert and, and Patty, thank you, uh, and DC Culture and History for making this learning possible. Uh, we have a series, Robert and I have conducted a series called The Spoken Word, and I have other spoken words, one on reparations. Uh, this will, the first one of these will be next Sunday, April 3rd, five o'clock, Poems of War, Voices of Elegy and Lament, uh, classic, War poetry dedicated to the peoples of Ukraine. And unfortunately, that's not on our calendar just yet, but I'll also email everyone the Zoom information for that so you can join us next week as well. There, there will be one of these once a month. Uh, uh, basically, they are readings of poetry, and they're um, my, former, my former life as an English professor, I suppose. And the first one I'm dedicating to the peoples of the Ukraine. Of Ukraine. On Emancipation Day, April 16th, 2022, and this is the first emancipation, not the other emancipation. At one o'clock, there will be a uh, Stations of Enslavement, a walking memorial, enslaved Washington, 1790 through 2020. We will begin at the front door of the Smithsonian Castle. And, in Washington, D.C., for those of you that are in the D.C. area. Um, and Robert, as, as I should say, that Robert screened this on D.C. Culture and History's platform so you can find the if you want to refresh yourself before you come or if you want to actually see it again uh it's on uh, and robert you can put that out where it is but this will be uh, probably a, uh, i'll keep it i hope to two hours hour and a half to two hours walk through the central um the what what somebody called the the hor horrific emporium of enslavement in washington dc and we'll start at the uh, Smithsonian. We will walk down around the Capitol. We will walk up around the Federal Triangle, and uh, in that particular area, that's yep. where that's where the, most of the enslavement business in Washington took place. And this is why I think the 1902 Macmillan Project, basically to remove all of that and redesign all of that, it had the effect, in terms of an archaeological dig, of removing and hiding the history of Washington D.C., the enslaved history. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks, Edward. Thanks again. So we'll email out the information for all that stuff, um, but it won't be till tomorrow. So stay tuned. And again, everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great Easter weekend. Stay safe. Patty, thanks for helping out with the chat. Um, Edward, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Blessings. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Take care.